feel like you're being pulled in a thousand directions? Let's fix that. Download your free rebalancing toolkit and learn how to design an optimized week that lets you feel like you have it all. Get the goods at brilliantbalance.net slash have it all. I'm Sherilyn Skolnicki, and this is Brilliant Balance, the show for working women who are ready to shine. Each week, I bring you ideas, inspiration, and insight on balance, business, and getting it all done gracefully. You ready? Let's be brilliant. This is episode 96 of the Brilliant Balance podcast. And today we are talking about how to stay on track even when life gets crazy. And I have Allison Tibbs joining me. Allison is um, amazing. She is a personal trainer and healthy lifestyle coach on the West Coast who really is an advocate for women to use fitness and nutrition and self care as a way to bring their lives into balance, you know, to find more peace, more joy and more of a sense of purpose in their life. And I will tell you, you're going to find she really leads by example. Because there was a time not so very long ago when she found herself almost taken under by depression and by anxiety. And this is when she was living a corporate life um, before she took a year off to do what she calls her Eat, Pray, Love chapter. So she really began her journey toward healing through adopting a healthy and an active lifestyle. And she was able to see the seeds of purpose in that chapter in her own life. So now she pays that forward, right? And she works with clients in the US, in Canada, in Mexico, and in Asia through a really results-driven system. And so we don't get so much into the details of her system today as we do her path into this work. Why does she do it in the first place? Because I think so many of the women I talk with are trying to see the seeds of purpose in their own life experience and trying to figure out how to pull all that together or piece all that together into a pathway where their work is very much aligned with their heart. And I think Allison is a shining example of that, on top of which she is really an expert in helping women who function at a very high level and who have a lot of things together in their lives get their health in order. And in my experience, that is one of the areas that even the highest performing women often neglect. Um, There's a lot of narrative in this world about that being selfish or self-indulgent. And I think we're starting to crack the code on it, but it is still very much a challenge. And so I I will never tire of having women talk um, to my listeners about health and wellness and well-being and how critically important it is as an underpinning for everything that you want to bring into the world. So Allison's conversation um, about staying on track when life happens is one that I think you're going to get a lot out of. But again, it goes well beyond that, really into her own path to aligning her work with her purpose. And I think that is perhaps even some of the highest value um, that you'll extract from today's conversation. So without further ado, here is my interview with Allison Tibbs. Okay, Allison, I am so happy to have you with us. Thank you for being on the Brilliant Balance Show. Great. Thank you so much for having me. So I'm starting to really love these interview format shows because we used to do just me talking to the audience every week, and it has been so well-received to have guests. Do you get to do a lot of these? I do. And I love doing this type of format because it gives us a chance to talk about real issues and to have real conversations about them and to let people know that it's normal. We all go through these things. Yes. Yes. So first of all, will you tell everyone about what you do professionally today? And then also a little bit about what your life looks like outside of work. Sure. So what I do professionally is I'm a healthy lifestyle coach and personal trainer. So I'm based in San Francisco and I really work with women to help them redefine what their well-being can look like and then help them to put a plan together to live that healthy life and get the results they're really looking for. When I'm not working with my clients who I adore, I am 
typically creating recipes. I love cooking, uh, taking dance classes. And as of late, it's really just been about taking the time and being open to whatever brings me joy in the moment. I made one of my core values of this year all about freedom. Mm -hmm. So that's been my big thing for this year. That's awesome. So what does that mean for you when a core value is freedom? Like what are some of the things you're testing? So literally s- simple things like, okay, I wake up and I, I'm like, okay, what do I want to do today? And just think, what are my possibilities? What are the, the opportunities that are available? And I just kind of go with it and give myself a little bit of grace if you know, it's not exactly what I had plans for that day. And I've stumbled upon amazing restaurants, museums, hiking, just things I never thought I would enjoy doing that I've just fallen in love with. That's so cool. It it reminds me a little bit. I read a couple of years ago Shonda Rhimes' book, um, The yes. Year of Yes. Have you read it? I have exactly. Yes. yes. And it, so, if you haven't read it, what it reminds me, you know, basically, her premise is she found she was saying no to a lot of things and decided I'm just going to start saying yes to like every opportunity and invitation that comes my way, and see what it gins up. And it it opens up all these extraordinary worlds in her case. So I always try to think of that. I can be very routinized. And so it's good for me to stay open to adventure where I can. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> Within reason. <laughs> right. Within, you know, there's a, there's a time and a place for rhythm and for ritual, but sometimes it's good to just stay open to possibilities. One of my favorite words. Exactly. So the work that you're doing today, what does a typical day look like for you or week or, you know, I know that there's probably some variation from day to day. Absolutely. So on average, I'm working with about five to six clients a day, really just digging deep into mindset, digging deep into habits, creating those plans, doing a lot of accountability, and just really working with them on that step-by-step process because it can be a bit difficult of working with your health, your fitness, your nutrition, your self-care, and it's such a delicate space. So really taking the time to work with each client. And then of course, I have to make sure that I'm taking care of my own well-being. So also do my own workouts throughout the day, you know, eating healthy, taking some time for self-care. So it's it's a mix of doing doing what I love and also living what I love to do. So it's it's yes. a nice balance there, which I'm really grateful for. And how how did you find your way to this work? Because you didn't start here. Tell us about where you started. Absolutely. I, I started be, I started believing that I wanted to be this marketing executive. So at the age of I think 15 or 16 years old, I remember seeing this thing about marketing executives and I did a class project on it. And from there I was off and running. I was student council president because I knew that I could have leadership skills. I could put on my you know resume for college and all these things. And I did the whole marketing internships, marketing degree, international business degree, did all of that through college, got the job, worked for a media company, lived in Chicago, then New York. And at the age of 25, I took a step back and realized I was very unhealthy. Mm -hmm. I was very unhappy and just felt very unfulfilled. And at the time I was living in New York, I was working in Manhattan. And I remember having so much available to me, having so much opportunities. The, The corporate ladder was seemed very welcoming to me. I was doing very well in my job, but I just wasn't happy. And I remember Skyping with my dad and he just looked at me and he just said, you are too young to look like the weight of the world is already on your shoulders. Mm. And at that moment, I started to figure out what I wanted to do. Didn't really know. So I quit my job at 25 and I went to Europe to find myself. It was my eat, pray, love moment. (laughs) And... (laughs) And, you know, I I always joke and say, I found myself in a small village in Switzerland between a pasture and a vineyard. And in that, that time where no one really spoke a lot of English, French was not that great. I just spent a lot of time working on myself, a lot of personal development, a lot of just spending time sleeping and getting outside, going for hikes. I was cooking my meals and just really taking some some time with myself. And I felt, I've never felt better in my entire life. And I came back to the States and gained all the way back. The depression came back, the anxiety came back. And that's when I knew that I had to make this a true priority of taking care of myself. And then people noticed. 
and they started asking me to help them. And of course, I'm like, I don't know how to do any of this. <laughs> and she's like, what do you, what, how do I even begin? And it was one of those moments where I had to put my, my self-sabotaging fears and excuses and the, I don't know what to do. I had to put all that behind me and just lean all the way in. So I got the certifications I needed. I went through different coaching programs. I got a mentor and I just said, this is it. This is what I was meant to do. And I haven't looked back. It's been about 10 years and I'm, I'm still here and very happy about the work that I do. And, and so, yeah, it was such a big transformation. Yes. And it's interesting. It's so clearly, you just almost use the word that, you know, this is your purpose. This is what you're meant to do. Something that we hear, I hear all the time with the women who I'm in coaching relationships with is how do I know when it's my purpose? You know, sometimes people don't even feel like they have the seeds of an idea. Sometimes they have the seeds of an idea, right? Or they've had an experience that felt like they could glimpse it or touch it, but then claiming it as purpose and orienting your life around it is a whole different step. So why do you, or maybe how do you feel like you got that clarity? What were the clues that this really was it? I think the first clue was when I was just living my life. I was living my truth and people were drawn to that because I feel there at that time as well, I was thinking about maybe starting my own marketing firm and trying some other different things. I had a lot of different pots on the the stove at the time. And the one thing that people just seemed to be gravitating towards was was that that version of who I was. Mm -hmm. And that was where I felt the most at home in my own skin. So that was the first clue was by simply just living my life that I was getting this traction. Two, it was when you started to hear how you were helping people. When I would hear people that I would work with or give them one keystone tip or piece of advice and they would take it and a week later, two weeks later, they're messaging me or calling me and saying that worked. That, that, that changed everything for me. Mm-hmm. So those two things really made it clear that I'm living it, I love it, and it's providing value to other people. And that little trifecta just had me off and running. It was a fuel that I needed. Yeah. So you said, I'm living it, I'm loving it, and it's providing value. That's an interesting little soundbite that, you know, I like the way you wrap your head around that. I'm always saying, I I get my definition of purpose from Frederick Buechner and he says it's where, um, like our greatest gifts, I'm paraphrasing, our greatest gifts meet the world's greatest need. So Mm -hmm. when it's always rooted in service, isn't it? Purpose is always rooted in service. And I love it when you said like, when you're the most yourself, you, you said, I really felt like I was in my own skin and people were saying, gosh, this is helping me so much. Like those two things together often sit at the intersection of purpose. I love that. Yes. Absolutely. What do you love most about your work? Like tactically speaking first, what, what activities do you actually love doing in your work today? I, I really love having those coaching conversations where we're just attacking things head on where we are looking at limiting beliefs, we're looking at some of our challenges, our obstacles. And there's something, I I think it's like magic that happens because you're able to create the safe space for people to really share and to be open and to be honest. And when you start to see those layers peel away and you start to see or hear the inflection in their voice, it all starting to, to come together and that empowerment moment, there's this moment that happens, and I'm sure you get this too with working with your clients, where something within them changes and you just see how they look at something differently or you see how they phrase their, their language around an issue or a challenge. And in that moment, you know that that's going to change the whole trajectory of the coaching that you're going to do together and their life. That's one of my absolute favorite. I live for those moments because yeah. it's it's just like the mama bird, you know, it's like, okay, they're they're getting ready to fly and and now you'd have fun. That's when the fun begins. So the, having those conversations, I, I just adore. And you know, in, in a grander scheme, I think it's also just being able to see 
them start to f- just figure out what's going to work for them and, and getting them excited about health and wellness or, or just anything in general, any obstacle they have in their life, seeing the other side of it. That's for me, it's, it's, I love it. I, that's what keeps me going every single time. Yeah, it's interesting. You love the one-on-one. You know, you love the personal transformation that you're witnessing and and seeing that crack open in someone. And I think it's it's very powerful and it's becoming more rare because so much of the coaching industry and across all disciplines is moving to group and scale yeah. and course. And so that the the impact of really walking that path with someone one-on-one is where you get those moments. Exactly. It's fascinating. What do you what do you like the least? Because this is, I think this is a myth that when you're living out your purpose, it's all sunshine and roses. Right. <laughs> you and I both know it's not. So what what's something that you don't like about your work these days, but you have to do it because it's connected to the purpose? Well, it's it's that double-edged sword, that personal coaching, that more intimate type of coaching. Because on the flip side, it's when you're dealing with very delicate things, right? You're dealing with um, stories that we've told ourselves about our ability to lose weight, to get healthy. Um, Our worth as women is tied up into our physical appearance. A lot of times our our confidence. So uh, for me, on the flip side, it's that when you see that start to to trickle in or start to rear its head back into the progress that we've made, because as a coach, I, I want the success of every person I work with sometimes I feel like more than they want it and not because of, of, of where they are, but just because of what I see of the potential I see and everyone that I work with. And so when you see that start to happen, you see that shift, you see that energy change. It's, I try to take it personal, right? Because it's like, but we were doing so great. And then you let this one comment just totally deflate you and take you back to square one. And so being able to care for them, in that moment, in that space, but also being able to find the tools and give them the the skill set and the mindset and the push that they need to get out of that valley. That to me is, is one of the things that just really sometimes gets me. I take it personal. You know, mm-hmm. I think for me, I internalize it. I feel like I'm a horrible coach. And, you know, I just have to remind myself that it's part of the process mm-hmm. and that it only makes me stronger and better. It helps me to be agile, but it also helps the person that I'm working with because it also lets them know that this journey is not always rainbows and butterflies. Right, right. Okay, ladies, who's ready for two days of big ideas and fun experiences with a group of extraordinary women? We've put together a high energy venue and a girlfriend getaway vibe just for you. If that sounds like your idea of a good time, then please join me at our next Brilliant Balance Live. It's in Cincinnati on September 26th and 27th, 2019. And tickets are on sale now at CherylAnnSchoolNikki.com forward slash live. Come learn how to chase your biggest professional dreams, raise a thriving family, and still fiercely protect breathing room just for yourself. I'm going to help you find a new rhythm for getting things done, one that keeps you focused, energized, and fully engaged. Your life, it's about to get a major upgrade. Get your tickets today. The link is in the show notes. Well, yeah, I think it's interesting because the the when you're emotionally invested in your work, right, the highs are higher, but the lows are lower. You know, you're exactly. walking through that pain with them. What? So I wonder this, a lot of the women, I know I felt this when I was working in the health and wellness industry, and, and I wonder if you can relate to it. Do you feel like sure. you hold yourself to an impossibly high standard because you know people are watching what you're doing? You know, when I first started out, I did. And, you know, I, I will be the first person to admit that I tried to make sure that I looked a certain way, that I was eating perfectly amount of calories in, calories out, working out every day. And what I realized that actually was creating a barrier between mm-hmm. myself and the people that I wanted to connect with, because I was living at this, this level of, you know, quote unquote perfection that's almost impossible to live, that it was so intimidating for other people. Right. And it was, well, how can I do it? And I remember I posted something on Instagram. I'm, I'm a big Instagram person. And I remember posting a picture of me eating a burger. And it was like I broke the internet. 
<laughs> it was it was this crazy moment and a huge shift where people saw that I was human. Yes. People saw that I like to eat a burger, that I, you know, there are moments where I don't, you know, hop out of bed wanting to work out first thing in the morning. And what that did is I think it opened up this level of grace and this level of of just care for myself. Yeah. And and I now move that into how I work with my clients is it's not about perfection. And that's why I say we have to redefine what it looks like. We have to redefine what healthy eating looks like based off of, you know, principles and philosophies that are health driven that are going to serve you. But there's wiggle room because each person's different. A single woman who has no children and, you know, is working a nine to five versus a client that I work with who has three kids running a household and a job and a spouse. What, what, that's going to look very different Mm -hmm. in your workout schedule, your eating schedule. And I can't say that one is right or wrong. They're just different and we have to do that. So so I gave myself the grace first, and then I try to pass it on to anyone that I connect with because that's we are so hard on ourselves as women. The last thing I want to do is be another person on Instagram or social media posting my perfect life and making it seem impossible for other women. I, I think that was my experience as well was ultimately when people started saying like, I don't want to see you in the grocery store because I don't want you to see what's in my cart. I thought, okay, right. this is a problem. Like, you know, that there is, um, there's a level of realness that has to be in play where it's, I am a big kind of believer in the 80-20 rule. It's probably the simplest way to talk about it. Just most of the time, get it right. Right. And understand that some of the time you're intentionally or unintentionally not going to get it right. So I like to hear you say that because otherwise we're only helping the people who are willing to go all in at a level of perfection that's not, it's not realistic or sustainable for most of us. So we have to find progress in that imperfection. You know, exactly. Um, well, that's a perfect transition to the the meat and potatoes of our topic today, which is yes. you know, I wanted you to share about how to stay on track in your case with mostly with healthy habits when life happens. So many of the women that I work with and coach tell me, you know, I I got it. I made these changes and I have everything in rhythm and I'm excited and I feel good about it. And then something happens, you know, so back to school comes or the holidays come or summer vacation comes or, you know, somebody has a, a surge at work and all of a sudden they get into all or nothing thinking yeah. and they abandon all of the habits. And you have three strategies that are designed to really help us stay on track with our healthy lifestyle when life happens. So I want to talk about those. Absolutely. Um, Okay. So first you say, choose a non-negotiable habit that you will do every single day, no matter what. Tell me a little bit about that. Well, the reality is, is you, you articulated it perfectly. So many things will, will be on this great stride and then anything happens. I mean, and sometimes if there's small things that happen, but they throw us off our game. And so the first thing is that non-negotiable thing that you do, typically it's going to be a small thing, something small. It doesn't have to be this big thing. So it doesn't mean my non-negotiable is to work out for two hours every single day <laughs> because be life happens. Right? <laughs> That's a tough one for most people. But for example, I have a client who, um, she is an attorney and she, whenever she goes into trial, she gets sick, she gets strep throat. So when she came to me, she says, I always get strep throat, never failed. So after talking to her a little bit more, I realized that we just have to get her immune system up. You know, she's not sleeping well. And I said, okay, I want you just to start every single day while you're in trial to take a multivitamin with a probiotic. I just wanted her to get some nutrients in her body and keep her gut health on track. And that was the only thing I said, I don't care at this stage. I don't care whatever else happens, but take that multivitamin every single morning with a probiotic. She did that. And I'm not going to say that that probiotic you know, changed or saved her life, but she didn't get strep throat yes. this time in trial. 
And what she said, so I said, let's talk about it. And she said, well, when I was taking the multivitamin, I wanted to make sure that it really worked. So I would eat a salad. I try to eat a salad once a day. And I knew that the probiotic was helping with my digestion. So I also wanted to make sure that I drank more water. So that way I wasn't, you know, kind of undoing all the good work. So what we fail to realize is sometimes those small little things that we do first, they compound over time. They compound, and over the course of a week, a month, a year, that builds into a healthy habit that's supporting your body. But secondly, on a meta level, you start to think a little bit differently because you want to support that. That, that small decision that you're making every day. And it's empowering enough so that you can do that. And you start to do other habits. So it's a little bit of a, a Jedi mind trick, yes. but just that small non-negotiable. And you know that's it. You know, If you can stick to one thing, it also gives you that sense of control that you, yes. that you haven't lost full control of your life because you've chosen to do that one thing every day. So second, you say track your progress against that one thing. Yes. Because if you if you don't track it, then you don't know how well you're doing. And then at the end of it, or or as you're going through, you you know, I think we all have those moments where like, I don't know why I'm so tired. I don't know why I feel this way. And then I, you know, I'll work with the client and say, okay, well, let's go back. Let's look at your sleeping habits over the past week, or let's look at how much water, how much coffee you've drank. And there you see the light bulbs pop. Oh, mm-hmm. yeah, you're right. So I always say track what you're doing so that way you have some data. Because when we have data, we can make better decisions. When we have data, we can course correct. But it's very hard to to make changes, to upgrade, to downgrade when you don't know what's going on. And it just allows you to also get some confidence, right? So having the non-negotiable gives you that control when life happens. When you track your progress, it gives you that confidence that you're doing something that's going to serve you because you can physically see it. Yeah, I am so with you on this because I think often otherwise it's a mystery. Why do I feel like garbage? And then if you don't have the data to know what habits shifted, you can't reverse engineer a solution. You know, so I love this thing of like keep track of what is happening even when life is crazy town because then you have the data to go back and be able to say, oh, I see what I have to course correct. I haven't been drinking water. I haven't, whatever the thing is, that data is everything. Okay. And then the third one is really important and I think might be the hardest and that is celebrate your accomplishments. Absolutely. We are so hard on ourselves. I've, I've yes. said that before. And you know, our, our brains, a healthy brain will tend to always go to the negative, which is our reptilian brain, right? It's, that's what's kept us alive. You know, we look for danger. We look for, for things out there that, that we need to be aware of. And so what I like about celebrating is that it, it kind of retrains that reptilian brain a little bit. You know, we're no longer in a space where we're at danger of being eaten by saber toothed tigers. So we don't necessarily need that all the time. And so changing that, that mindset of celebrating, whether it's big things or small things, it does something to that process. And, you know, what I'll typically do is I have my non-negotiables for the day. And if I do that, I'll reward myself. Sometimes I reward myself with taking a bath. Baths are like, in my mind, I think a bath solves, solves every problem. There's no problem that cannot be solved with a bath. I, I think I've tested that theory enough. So a lot of times that's my reward is, is that bath or I'll celebrate with, you know, just a glass of champagne or something. You know, sometimes you just yeah. have to get a little, you know, yeah, it's a Tuesday. I'm going to have a glass of champagne to celebrate that I did this thing. But we just don't celebrate ourselves enough. And I think what happens is we tend to look at, well, okay, I did four out of the five days. So I didn't do that fifth day. So I, I'm a failure. No, you did something great today. Let's celebrate that. And it, it does something It does something to you. It, it, it kind of takes the confidence and the control and just elevates it to where you keep doing it. And when you can also get people involved in your celebration, it can be really fun. One of my clients at the end of the week, they all have their non-negotiables for her children, her husband and herself. And at the end of the week, they do a pizza party. Mm-hmm. And, you know, and it's funny because now they make the pizzas at home. They make their own crust. They use up the cauliflower crust. It's still healthy pizza, but it's just something they do together as a family. And it's just, they celebrate, they celebrate their wins for the week. Big wins, small wins. 
I think what I love about this, and again, it really, it resonates with me because I work with such high functioning women who are so hard on themselves that our reward center in our brain is almost like underutilized. Yes. And the thing is, it, you know, it's, it's basic human nature that we will repeat what leads to a reward. So yes. as soon as your brain makes that connection, like I did this thing that's good for me and there was a positive reward or outcome that honestly was a little more short term than we're used to. Most of right. us, you know, again, I think very high functioning women are super attached to delayed gratification. It's part of what got us here. So we keep pushing the reward out further and further. But yes. bringing that timeline in and saying, look, I got through a week, so I'm going to have a reward that is right sized, you know, it matches yeah, the exactly. effort. It, you activate that cycle of I do this thing, I get a reward, right? We're like the little rat in the cage. So yeah. it, it's really important that you don't look past that. I, I can just almost envision people rolling their eyes like, uh huh, I got one and two, but eh, I don't need rewards. And it's yes. really critical. It's like a it's a piece of the brain science, really, in this one. Exactly. Cool. So I love how simple this is. The you know one habit that becomes your through line tracking your progress against it so you're really honest with yourself and then rewarding yourself or celebrating that you stuck with it during this surge, you know, like the storm surge period. What do you do when you come out the other side? When life, how do you know how to go back into a higher gear when life normalizes? Well, the beauty of this type of model is that you've now created habits that continue on. And so you're no longer thinking about them and they just become a part of what you do. Mm -hmm. And I'll go back to my client with the attorney because now, you know, she's still taking her multivitamin every day, not just because she's in court, because she realizes it's important to her. Mm -hmm. And now we've just kind of leveled up what she's doing. We've leveled up different things. And it's been really great to see that she doesn't have to use these crisis mode things anymore. It's just a part of who she is and she she likes it and yes. she feels good about it. It's like it stacks up and down. I call it habit stacking. But if if you know your baseline, this is your one habit. For her, it was the multivitamin with the probiotic. Knowing what do you stack on second, third, fourth. So when you're feeling really strong, you've got a stack of habits that you're able to sustain. And exactly. then you know how to dial it backwards when life goes sideways, right? So exactly. That, I think it's important that we acknowledge, you know, you don't stay with one forever. You, of course, right. when things are good, you can stack multiples on top, but that becomes your baseline. What's the thing? Exactly. The, yeah. Love it. Yeah. Because when life happens, that's not, that's not the time to <sighs> add something new right. or something different or, you know, it's, that's not the time. The time is to know what works for you and to hold, those are your lifesavers. Yeah. Those are the things that you know that you have. And once life you know, slows down, you get back into the scheme of things, the kids are now in school and they've gotten their schedule, the work deadlines are over, take a moment to, to breathe, reflect, and then you can, you know, exactly. Yes. Love it. Okay. So before we wrap up for today, Allison, I want to do the speed round of questions with you. And we have five of them. Okay. You ready? Okay. Yes. All right. First one is, what makes you feel brilliant? Ah, uh, taking baths. <laughs> what? <laughs> Hands down, taking baths. What's your favorite time-saving or productivity hack? To meal prep my food. Such yes. a one. Yeah. What have you learned to say no to? Attending events that don't bring me joy. I'd rather stay at home in that case. Yeah. I'm with you. I, ca I call it JOMO, the joy <laughs> of missing out. <laughs> I love it. What is one dream that you're chasing these days? Starting a podcast. Yes. And what's the song that you turn on when you need to get in the zone? Anything Beyonce. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> so good. So good. She is definitely on a lot of people's top list for that. So Allison, <laughs> thank you so much for joining us today. Where can people find you online? Sure. Well, one, thank you for having me. This was so much fun. You can find me online. You can go to allisontips.com. If you check any social media platform, Instagram is where I'm typically the most active. You just find me, Allison Tibbs. I'm there doing a lot more of my tips and sharing videos and recipes and time-saving tips and tricks. So that's typically where I, where I live. 
Perfect. And we will link those in the show notes so people can simply click through to find you. Perfect. And I will tell you, Allison has a fantastic food blog with just gorgeous photography. It's going to make you want to eat healthy. So take a look at what she's got. And thank you again so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. All right. I hope that you enjoyed my conversation with Allison Tibbs as much as I enjoyed having it. She is such a delight and doing such good work in the world. And it is just always inspiring to speak with someone who has truly made the leap to aligning her work with her purpose. And you can hear it in every word, every syllable that she speaks, that she believes so deeply in what she is doing um, that it fuels her from day to day. And I know so many of us are on a quest for that. So I, I want to keep putting examples of inspiration in front of you so that you can draw you know, inspiration and ideas from their journeys and apply them to your own. So that is it for this week. I would love to hear your thoughts on this week's episode in comments or to write a review of the podcast. We always love having those come in. Next week, we are back with the answer to one of life's most difficult questions. And that is the question that you may have been asked, which is, mommy, why do you work? And I will never forget the first time that I was asked that question, nor will I forget my answer. And I think it's going to be really interesting territory. We're going to do this one as a bit of an homage to Labor Day. So when you think about Labor Day and all that we honor in terms of working and the role that work plays in our lives, for those of us with children, the standard is very high on how we will answer that question. And so we're going to dig into it next week give you some strategies that you might want to think about in case you get asked that question so that you feel really good about the answers that you're giving to your children and that you're very clear on the message that you're sending to them with how you choose to answer that question. So we're going to dig into that next week. I will look forward to it. Until then, my friends, let's be brilliant. Okay, ladies, who's ready for two days of big ideas and fun experiences with a group of extraordinary women. We've put together a high energy venue and a girlfriend getaway vibe just for you. If that sounds like your idea of a good time, then please join me at our next Brilliant Balance Live. It's in Cincinnati on September 26th and 27th, 2019. And tickets are on sale now at CherylAnnSchoolNikki.com forward slash live. Come learn how to chase your biggest professional dreams, raise a thriving family, and still fiercely protect breathing room just for yourself. I'm going to help you find a new rhythm for getting things done, one that keeps you focused, energized, and fully engaged. Your life, it's about to get a major upgrade. Get your tickets today. The link is in the show notes. This is the podcastfactory.com.